Wow, what an introduction, man. Yeah, uh, not even close to Jesus, okay? Not even close. But uh, thanks. That was really, really gracious of you. And uh, yeah, God's, God's been good to us. Um, I'd like to kind of to lead into, I'd like to share a little bit to you about, uh, about Iris and I and how we came together and all of that. But, but in the context of God's vision and, and vessels is really what I'd like to talk about. And that, that God has a vision for each of us individually as well as the world and how each of us fit into that vision. And yet his vision does not become reality without vessels. But, you know, our lives really are limited to our vision. You know, what you, what you see is what you get, as the saying goes. You know, beauty is in the eye of the beholder, you know. Um, not long ago, I was talking to a, a guy, a really committed Christian lay guy, a bit older. And, you know, you would understand this. I'm, I'm up here, and I'm just maybe a couple years older than you, two or three. And, uh, but he was talking about, you know, the, the way, you know, young people and even regular adult churches, you know, the way they dress now. He's like, you know, man, they have holes in the jeans. I mean, he's freaking out over, you know, hipster stuff. I mean, it, it really blew his, his mind. His, his circuits were fried, you know. Because to him, that's just huge, you know, and tats and piercings and all this kind of stuff, you know. And I was trying to kind of explain, you know, well, you know, what, what you were wearing and what you were looking like when you were their age was freaking your parents out, you know, this kind of thing. But it's in the eye of the beholder. You know, I remember... Um, a comedian once, he was talking about, especially men, and I'm old enough that I can relate to this now, and you can probably tell even by looking at me, but he said, you know, men, older men tend to dress in the style of the last good year of their life, which is usually in their 20s, okay? You know what I'm talking about? And he said, you can see it walking down the street, you know, it's like 85, 94, 78. I mean, you just know they're, they're still frozen at like 28 years of age. You know what I'm saying? Because to them and their, their eye, that looks, that's sweet. You know, that's, that's it. So, but the way we see things is so critical because it really shapes the way we live. It's, it's our mind's eye. And it's, it's even funny how when we're kids, the way we see things. I remember I was born in Africa as an MK, missionary kid, sorry. And, uh, we came back, we were living in, in uh, the headquarters city of the Assemblies of God there, and they had this little village of cottages where missionaries could live in during their furlough that they're back in the States. And so I was like five years old, and I was up playing on the sidewalk, and this, this big tall man is, is walking toward me, and so I was pretty, you know, friendly and outgoing, and so I walked right up to him, and I said, well, hello, what's your name? And he goes, well, I'm Rex Jackson. I said, well, I'm Jan Hurst. What do you do? He says, well, I'm a missionary. I said, oh, my dad's a missionary too, but the rest of us are Christians. Now, I was still trying to understand, see, now I'm a missionary. I'm not a Christian anymore. You go from Christian, now you're a missionary, you see. But the way we see things, hopefully in time, we start to see clearer and clearer and more what God is having us see as through his vision. And it was really when I was about 12 years old that God's vision for my life began to form. My dad had been the, the, what we call regional director, but overseer of all American Assemblies of God missionaries in Asia and the Pacific. And so he related a lot to all these countries and leaders. And so many of them would come from Asia to where we lived and visit, and they would stay in our home. And I remember one in particular, um, I'm sure many of you will know, Pastor Cho in Korea. Um, he was a very dear friend of my dad many years ago, and he came and stayed in our house and uh, for several days, and I was like 11 years old, and I was just captured by this man. And his church then was, was very small. It was like just like 20,000 people because it hadn't taken off yet, you know. And, but it was just starting to take off. And I'm sure most of you know it's the world's largest church, the largest church in history, you know. I don't know where it's at now, like 800,000. It's been that way for a long, long time. But anyway, he was, you know, starting to grow, and he's like, man, you know, I shall mash over there. He had a cute accent, you know. So many people come to church, I shall mash over there. And, and God was doing things. But I remember as I listened to him and I saw how God was using this man who had been a Buddhist monk, dying of tuberculosis, a young man. And I'll, I'll condense it very quickly. And a young girl came to his, his place every day and would knock on his door wanting 
to give him a New Testament. And he was so bitter. He was dying as a young man. And he would slam the door in her face, send her away. The next day, she was there again. Day after day after day, she refused to stay away. And finally, one day, he took the New Testament from her, slammed the door in her face, because she promised if he took it, she'd never bother him again. Well, you know the rest of the story. He began to read. And Jesus revealed himself to him, healed him of tuberculosis instantaneously. He went on. He was discipled and trained by missionaries, started and pastors the largest church in history. But God had a vision for Cho Young Gi and for all the people that he would reach. But it started with a vision through a young girl who was the vessel of that vision, a 12-year-old girl. Are you with me? God does things through all kinds of people, ages, classes, whatever it is. He's the master that is putting this all together and weaving this tapestry. And all we have to do is be the vessel he has called us to be. Well, I was 12 years old, and God began to shape in my heart a call to missions. But when I graduated from university, I knew that I still I had not lived overseas. We, we ended up growing. I grew up in Springfield, Missouri, where our headquarters is. My dad almost died in Africa, so we had to move back. And he moved into missions leadership. So I wanted to go overseas to confirm my call. So I go to this little, little island country, tiny rock in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. And I remember before I left, I was like, you know, God, I went all through university. My sister and brother both married young. And so my family's like, you know, Jan's a little slow here. It's taken him a while to find someone, you know. This is back in the day when they married young and all that. And so I said, Lord, you know, you know, I'd like to get married someday, but it's got to be the right girl. But there's no way, obviously, I'm going to find my wife down in this little island country. So I said, these next two years are yours. I'm committing myself to them. I'm on a mission. I'm going to go. But when I finish there and I come back to the States, you and I are going hunting for the wife. And I, I'm serious. I really made that vow to him. And so I arrived. I remember it was the first Sunday in Apia, Western Samoa, the other, the I started to say the better Samoa, but just the other Samoa. No, she, she's from American Samoa. I'm, I'm, I'm kidding. Actually, I lived in American Samoa. But anyway, we arrived first in Apia, Samoa, and we were in the, the English-speaking church there, Peace Chapel, and I was so excited to be in the islands. I'd never been there, and I'm getting a feel for the people and watch the way they worship and all that. And, and uh, as I was looking across the congregation, my eyes really weren't on the Lord that morning. I was kind of seeing how they worship and that. And as I looked across she was. Then I really began to worship. And I said, thank you, Lord, for sending me. Let me tell you, if you're still single and you're looking, go to the mission field. Are you with me? Okay. God's got a plan for your life. Right, Katie? She loves that I said that. <laughs> She's going to kill me. Sorry. Anyway. <laughs> and so she was going to university in the States on a full government scholarship, but had to come home in the summer to work for the government. So she's there. She goes back to the States. I stay in Samoa living there. So she's living in the States. I'm living in Samoa. And she's very seriously dating a guy in, in the States. So while she's in the States, I'm in Samoa. I began to write her. And I, I just felt a burden, a call to counsel her. That, and she, need, she needed some serious discipling. And I just began to you know, tell her God's ways and that I knew God had a plan for her life. And it didn't involve this guy in Texas. It involved someone else that was in her home that God had special ordered for her right there. You know, well, long story short, uh, the Lord brought us together. She never, ever dreamed of marrying an American. But especially, she never dreamt of marrying a missionary. Okay? Uh, she was about, the, the word in Psalm 1 for a, 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 a pastor's wife or whatever is falitua. She never, in fact, her sisters for years, still to this day, they're like, I can't believe you're a folly too. I mean, you know, she grew up going to nightclubs and all this kind of thing, and they're like, there's no way you should be a pastor's wife, you know, or a missionary, you know. But God has a vision for each of us that he wants to unfold. And then as we learn to just obey one step at a time, we become vessels of that vision. And it's not just about me. Yes, it's about his plan for my life. But he has a plan to use me for many others. Okay? Missions is not missions for me. It's not just about my experience. That's part of it. But that's not the main thing. Are you with me? It's not about me. That's the nature of God. 
Okay, even the universe is expanding. God is, is a being of energy, of giving, of contributing, and that kind of thing. And so when you are in God's image, you are constantly producing, giving out. It's other-oriented. It's not about you. I think even Rick Warren's book, The Purpose Driven Life, I think that's like the first line. It's not about you, okay? If you want to find your life, what do you do? You lose it. It's the only way because that's the way the universe is wired, okay? So you're bucking the universe. You're, you're fighting the universe if you want to make it about you. If you want to have your needs met, if you want to be satisfied, then you go, if he sends the wind, I'll go the same way. I'll go. That's it. And so God has a vision for us, but we become the vessels of that vision when it becomes our place in his world, our place in his universe. God had a vision. I, I think of the Samaritan woman. And this, this woman that was pretty much the lowest status in society that she could be. Okay? Number one, she's a woman, which was low status at that time. You know, Pharisees, thank God, every day they weren't born a woman. A woman couldn't testify in court. Ladies, aren't you glad you were born in this, this century? Or, Yeah, amen. I knew tears. I knew I'd get a big one from tears on that one. But she was a woman. Okay, already she's second class. Secondly, to put it bluntly, because Jesus said it, she was, she was a cheap woman. She was loose. She had, been, she had been an immoral woman. So then that drops her way down. And we're still not done yet. Then she's a Samaritan. Okay, she's as low as you can go. But God had a vision for her. Remember, and I don't know if any of you were in the services last night or today, but, ever, but every child of God is his favorite. Every child. He's the only one that can love like that. And that means lost and found. All of his prodigals, they're his favorite. Are you with me? She was his favorite daughter. And he had a vision for her. And so we know the story. And he transforms her life. She finally finds real love only in Jesus. And then what happens? He has a vision not just for her, but she became his vessel to that village and that area. She became the evangelist and the testimony that brought many people. Are you with me? The most unlikely person. I don't care how you feel about yourself. God has a vision and plan for you to impact this world locally and even globally. As you just follow day by day and let his vision start to come through into your mind's eye and see who I am and who he wants me to impact in this world to help them find who they are in his eternal kingdom. He, fi he finds vessels even that where we will not, you know, she was talking about, you know, our ministry and, and think a minute and, um, and just to kind of explain to you, uh, won't take long, but and if you, if you go online, we have an old, old website. We don't even use a website or anything anymore because what we do is we do everything locally. I mean, you can find it, but if you see it, it's going to be an ancient, ancient website that, that, you know, so just kind of a disclaimer up front. But what we do is we, we turn it over to national churches, local churches. We're in 36 countries and 16 languages. And we say, look, take it, use it however you want. Some of them use it in, in personal evangelism, small groups. It really started off in daily mass evangelism on radio, in newspapers. Now it's online. It's SMS texts and in national cell phone networks, the books in China. It just goes on. Stuff that we never envision. But that's the beauty is when it's God's vision, you just go with it. Okay? And no one, hardly anyone in the world has ever heard of Jan and Iris Hurst. Because that, we, we have people using Think A Minute. They have no idea where it came from. You know, like, oh, you, you do Think A Minute? Well, we didn't know where that came from. You know, this kind of thing. Because that's what it's about, is we are just vessels that pass it on. Paul had a vision for the Lycus River Valley, where the cities of Laodicea, Colossae, and Hierapolis were. And guess what? Churches were planted in those three cities, and Paul never went there. But he discipled a man named Epaphras who went there and planted those churches. God had a vision for Paul to reach that valley, and he used a vessel called Epaphras, whom he discipled. It just goes on and on and on. You will invest in people that you will help them 
achieve their vision for, for, from God and then the vision that God has through them to reach other people. That's the way he works, the body of Christ. You remember when Jesus said, greater works than these shall you do because I go to my Father? Greater works than these. He's talking about the works he did. Now, I don't know about you. When I hear that, I'm like, all right, hold it right there. We're going to do greater works than Jesus did. Okay, and what did he do? He did everything from healing to raising the dead. You know what I'm saying? Everything Jesus, and he says, we're going to do greater. How do you do greater works than that? Well, that's not what he's talking about. He's not talking about greater kinds of works. It's in the context of the Holy Spirit. He's saying, it's better for you that I go away because I'm sending the Spirit. Remember, on the earth, Jesus was limited to a body. He was not omnipresent here. So he could only minister to people in one place at one time, primarily. But now, what are we? We are now the body of Christ. Where's Jesus' body now? Jesus' body has grown and reproduced and multiplied around the world. And the same spirit that was in Jesus is now in his body now. And people are being saved and healed and transformed in China, in Ukraine, in Tanzania, in Argentina, in Indonesia, right now at the same time simultaneously because what? A greater number of works will be done on earth now through Jesus' body than when Jesus himself walked on the earth. Man, that's pretty exciting. <laughs> we are the vessels of his vision. We have our Father's eyes, and we have his body. We are his body that bring that into reality on this earth. That's the vision that he has for us. And it doesn't matter what class you are. I don't know if you remember. It's, I, I'm pretty sure it's the shortest book in the New Testament. Book of Philemon. You remember what it's about? A runaway slave named Onesimus. He takes the money and runs, and he runs into a guy named Paul who changes his life forever. And Paul disciples him, and then he writes to Philemon, his master, Onesimus' his master, and he says, I'm sending Onesimus back to you. The guy, the slave that ripped you off, I'm sending him back. I want you to take him back, and I will vouch for him. I will take care of whatever he has done to you, but he is now not just your slave. He is your brother. Well, the beautiful thing is 50 years later, the pastor of the church of Antioch was writing a letter to the church, to the pastor of the church of Ephesus. Ephesus, one of the greatest churches in the world at that time, as well as Antioch. And he writes the letter and he specifically addresses the pastor of the church of Ephesus named Onesimus. And he said, oh, there Scholars almost all agree, based on all the evidence in the context, it's the same Onesimus, the same runaway slave, who became the pastor of one of the greatest churches in the world at that time. That's the vision God had for him through Paul, through Onesimus, and then on through that, as they were vessels of that vision. It doesn't matter what class we are. It doesn't matter where we've been. It doesn't matter what job or, or, or skill we have. There's a guy uh, I told this morning, and I think last night too, yeah, about, if, if any of you were there, about a, a janitor, a custodian from California. Well, I want to tell you a story about another. I've got two great stories about custodians. And it's great because it shows you, it just underscores. This guy was named Clyde, Clyde the custodian. Pretty good, pretty good name. And uh, he worked at the University of Illinois. Okay, and he was a, a, just a dynamic Christian, loved God. He was just a custodian, just a janitor, and he happened to clean the offices of the academic uh, dean's building where all the academic administrators were, and he would share Jesus all the time with, with all these top administrators. He'd be cleaning their offices, you know, and singing and this kind of thing. Long story short, he led the academic dean of the University of Illinois to the Lord, the janitor, custodian, okay? And he led all kinds of students to the Lord. One student from Taiwan, he led to the Lord. The student graduated, went back to Taiwan, and led over 100 people in Taiwan to the Lord. Another guy named Mohammed from Egypt, he led to the Lord. He went back to Egypt, and he led, I think it was 60-some people in Egypt, okay, from a main religion there, okay. It started with a custodian, a janitor, okay. Who was a vessel of God's vision 
You see, wherever you are, whatever your job, whatever your career, whatever your class, it has nothing to do with it. Are you with me? And he will then take us beyond that, far beyond what we ever imagined he would do with our life. When we were here in Indonesia, there was a, a young man that came to our Bible school. We were three years in Malang and uh, teaching there, training pastors and church planters and that. And uh, his name was Agus, Agus Hedi. And he had been a, a very strong uh, follower of, of, of the main religion here. And he had been actually kind of the leader of all the, the young people in his area, uh, in the dieta there. He was a martial artist. And uh, they, would, they would beat up Christians regularly. And the thing that he said, just he could not get away from, that he could not understand, that bothered him so deeply inside, was that every time they beat them up, he said, the love that they showed, he could not relate to it. He said, they never retaliated. There never was anger. There never was revenge. And it just ate away at him. He's like, who has that kind of power to take that kind of abuse and then not retaliate? So long story short, one night he was in his prayers and Jesus revealed himself to him, literally in an audible voice. So he started going to a church several villages over so he wouldn't be seen or known. Happened to be in somebody's a God church. And he slipped into the back every service. And he would listen to the singing worship. But every time the pastor preached the word of God, his heart would just burn, he said. It would just burn every time he heard preaching about Jesus and the word of God. Well, he surrendered his life to the Lord. Long story short, he became known. Someone saw him, found out his father was going to kill him. And so he was kicked out of the house, was living on the streets. Finally, his grandparents took him in for, for, for the, like the last year of his high school. He was able to finish high school, selling newspapers on the street, this kind of thing. And he came to our Bible school. And he, during Bible school, um, some of you may know Jeff Hartensfeld. He's going to be here again next week. We were in the same city together as missionaries in Malang. And Jeff and I worked with him, worked with August. He met a girl at the Bible school. Beautiful story. They, they got married. He planted a church in Kadiri. And he now has a church of it's almost 1,000 people, four rukos. Jesus had a vision for that young man's life. And he found him. Any open heart that wants the truth, that wants their creator, he'll find a way to get to him. Are you with me? And he'll find vessels. And he sent him to a Bible school. And he sent Jeff and I along. And he sent other people. And now there are almost 1,000 people going to church in four rukos in Kadiri. Because God has a vision and he uses vessels to make it reality. There's a, a man that just suddenly died a few weeks ago. A man from Singapore. He's, he's American, but he's really Singaporean. His name's Rick Seward. Pastor Dave, PD, and I just flew to Singapore about a week and a half ago for his funeral. He was only 63 when he died. I know it seems really old to you guys, but that's fairly young. For, and uh, he was on the mission field in in Brazil, and he had a sudden, he was driving back late at night to another town to go to another meeting, and just instant head-on collision, just killed instantly, and it was just a shock to everyone. He, passed, he started and pastored the first mega church in Singapore many years ago, Calvary Charismatic Center. Iris and I were on staff with him. I was the academic dean in his Bible school. We were divisional pastors. I'm going back quite a few years now, but he started that church when he was 21 years old, a very gifted young man, and he wanted to become a missionary, and our, our mission in the States never appoints someone that young, but my dad happened to be on the committee then, and my dad knew Rick. He had seen him growing up, and he said, I believe, I don't, I, he's way underage, he's way too young, but I know God has his hand on him. He's a gifted man. He's highly intelligent, spiritually gifted. And so my dad said, I will vouch for him. No one else wanted to prove him, but my dad said, I will. And if he messes up, it's on me. And so Rick started the church. And the rest is history. But his vision was so far beyond Singapore. His church became basically a modern-day Antioch. And through the years, he has sent church planting teams around the world, and they have planted almost 11,000 churches around the world with an attendance 
anywhere at, at minimum 500,000. Many of them are smaller churches, some are larger. Anywhere from 500,000 to a million people. But it started with this 21-year-old man. And it just took some encouragers along the way and vessels of his vision. And then all those that came along God's vision through him and the vessels that God used. You, 21 years of age. Most of you, I got a feeling you're, you're older than that. I just don't want you to limit God's vision for you and what he has to do and use you in. Okay? He has a vision, but it's just starting. I remember a, a preacher years ago, he said, you know, 99% of all answers to prayer come on two legs. They're people. Okay? You pray for money. You pray for this or whatever. Where's the money come from? It doesn't drop out of the sky. It doesn't grow on trees. It comes through people. Okay? God chooses to use human beings made in his image who can choose to work with him, with his spirit, with his nature, with his character to reveal him to this world. I don't understand why he chooses to limit himself to us. It's just, I would never do that. I would never risk it on me. Are you with me? I would never do that. But that's the kind of love and grace and divine wisdom he has. There's a wisdom and genius to it that we don't get. And yet look what he's done. And now a greater number of works is being done around the world through this body of human beings. With all of our flaws, with all of our failures, if we are vessels, the vision is becoming reality. More people are coming to Jesus now than at any time in history, not even close to it. And he chose you to be part of this generation. I don't know why he chose. You could have been born 400 years ago. Why did he put you here now? Because he trusts you. He trusts you with this last hour harvest. Well, what, a, what an awesome privilege. That we get to be vessels of his end time vision. I'll close by telling you about the church in uh, Sri Lanka, Colombo, the pastor there actually. It's a church called People's Church, and they've been using our, our ministry, think a minute, for about eight years now. I mentioned this briefly. He, he's on the radio three times a day, five stations in English and Sinhalese, and reaching about two million people a day. 100,000 through the national cell phone network, largest cell phone network, I should say. And God's just done amazing things there. It's a church of about 10,000 and just growing and growing and growing and having an amazing impact on their country. Sri Lanka's about 70, is 76% Buddhist, I think. So, so, for example, our program there, he's not able to, on the radio, present Christ because it's illegal to do that. But he does it, and then it connects them to the church, and then they find Christ that way, and they have other links similar to the China thing. But it's made his church famous through Think a Minute. You know, he's Mr. Think a Minute of, of, Colum of Sri Lanka, you see. And that's what we do. It, you know, it's not about us. It's in those local countries. It's making Jesus and the church famous in those unreached cities and unreached people groups. Well, he told me about a man in his church, and I close with this, that had uh, a pretty amazing story. The man had grown up in the preacher's family. He was a preacher's kid. And his parents were really poor, pastors, but just dirt poor. And it made him so bitter at God because he saw his parents, they served God, and they never had enough money. You know, it was tough growing up. And he was like, you know what? If you serve Jesus and that's all you get, forget it. You know, if that's all, where's the blessing? Where's the favor I hear about? You know, all this kind of stuff. And so he turned his back on God. And at 16 years of age, he, he stole a bunch of money. He, it was a classic prodigal son story. Ran to the big city, lived wild for like six months, ran out of money, ran out of friends, and finally reached the end, and he was ready to commit suicide. And he was going to do it by drinking poison, and he went to the botanical gardens in, in Colombo, Sri Lanka. And he went there back into a corner, kind of behind a palm tree, and, and he was ready to drink the poison. And he put his head way back so it wouldn't burn his throat, so it would just go straight down. And as he's putting it back, he looks up, and in this palm tree, in this kind of corner of this garden, the weirdest place to put a banner advertising something, it said, if you need hope, come today to the YMCA at 5 o'clock. And he's like, what? <laughs> I mean... And it made him mad. He was so mad. And he said, oh, man. And he was mad at the missionaries that brought this gospel, brought Jesus to Sri Lanka, messed up his parents who were pastors for many years. They lived poor. He just, he hated Jesus. He hated missionaries. He hated everything to do with Christianity. So he said, I'm going to go. 
and I'm going to mess that meeting up so bad. I'm going to heckle the preacher. I'm going to yell. I'm going to mock him. And he did. And he went. And, and the, the preacher was so patient. And as he'd yell out things while the preacher, he'd say, please, son, please just be patient. He said, I'll talk to you afterwards. And he get, they had an altar call. People came forward. He came forward. He still was trying to disrupt the meeting. Well, he was the last one to leave the service that night, the last one to leave the altar. He had surrendered his heart to Jesus. The Holy Spirit melted his heart. And he felt called to the Bible, to Bible school, so he went to Bible school. Still dirt poor. His parents, his dad had died in the meantime, so they didn't have money to support him. So he'd work and, and then go to school a little bit, go back to work, go to school. Finally, he ran out of money. And he was leaving school, and as he was walking off the campus, the president sent someone to tell him and say, come see the president. He, of course, thought he was in trouble. He gets there, and the president said, come here, I want to I see you. And he hands him an envelope, and he grabs it, and he can feel there's, there's money inside. And he said, this letter just came for you, and it was from America. And he's like, what in the world, you know? Well, there was money in there to help him finish his term in the Bible school, and it was money and a letter from an elderly woman in Florida, okay, Panama City, Florida. She was a prayer warrior. She loved God. She was poor. She was an older woman. She mowed lawns to survive. She cut grass as an elderly woman. But she wrote a letter to our headquarters in Springfield, Missouri, and said, God told me about a country. This is before it was Sri Lanka. It was, it was called Ceylon, okay? Great tea, great tea. Anyway, and uh, she said, God told me that there's some Bible school student in Ceylon that needs help to finish Bible school. She could not find the country. She looked on a globe and a map. Of course, you know, Americans are just brilliant at geography, you know. Anyway, <laughs> we won't go there, you know. <laughs> Are you Japanese or Chinese? No, sorry. Some of you may remember that from the previous service. That's, anyway, and, uh, and so she sent the money, and then they forwarded it on to the Bible school, the Simpsonville Bible School in Sri Lanka. And he went on and finished Bible school. She kept sending him money every month for another, like, two years. He finished Bible school. There were times when, again, remember, she was really poor. And she would go without meat. She cut back on her eggs so that she could support him. There was a time when her roof was leaking. Her ceiling was leaking in her bedroom. So instead of using the money to fix it, she moved her bed out into the living room and slept in the living room so that she could use that money that she would have used to fix the ceiling to keep supporting this young man in Bible school. He finished Bible school. He started a church in Colombo, Sri Lanka. Church grew to become the largest Sami God church. He became the first general superintendent, which is what the Assemblies of God calls the, the head or leader of the Assemblies of God in that country. He then was used all over Asia, training pastors and leaders and church planting and all of that. You see, that man was Colton Wickramaratne, the father of Deshaun, who does think a minute and pastors that large church. Now, it was his dad that that had happened to who ended up reaching multiplied tens, if not hundreds of thousands of people. A 16-year-old boy that God had a vision for his life. And God was going to take him beyond what he ever dreamed. But it also took an elderly woman in Florida who heard God and obeyed him and was a vessel of that vision. And no one has ever heard of her. No one's heard her name. But I'm going to tell you her name now. Her name is Florence McConey. But I'll tell you one thing. When she got to heaven, her name was known up there. She was a hero up there. She was famous there. Because she was a vessel of God's vision for that boy, for that man, for that church in Sri Lanka. And now his son is pastoring that church and reaching millions of... It goes on and on and on because greater works than these shall you do if you will just be vessels of his vision. That's his plan for your life. It's not just about me. It's about me becoming what he wants me to be for the rest of his lost kids in this world. Amen.
Father, I just pray right now that you would touch our hearts. I pray that you'd speak to us. I just pray that if there are any here that they just sense that you are calling them in a special way. Each one is in a different place. Some are, are full on in their career. Some are wrapping up studies, whatever it is. Some are married, some are not. But I just pray that you would speak to each one and give them a fresh vision of who you have created them to be and the vessel that they can become of that vision, that you have destined them to become of that vision. If you're here right now with just eyes closed, you would just slip up your hand and say, Jan, just I want God to use me in a way that he hasn't before. I want to step out beyond where I have been. And I see now that I can impact this world so much more than I anticipated. I just want to obey him. That's it. Success is obedience. That's all it is. Success is obedience. And it's at each step of the way. And you just slip up your hand and say, pray for me, Jan. Put it right back down. I'm not going to take time, embarrass you. I'm not going to make you come up or anything. But you know that God has a vision for your life. Yes, anyone else, just slip up your hand, put it down. But you want him to use you in a way that he hasn't before. You don't want to limit him, but you want to go beyond the vision you have right now. His vision is so much greater for your life than you realize. Father, I pray that you would bless these that have indicated that their heart is wanting all of you and they put all of themselves in your loving hands. Bless them now. Use them. I pray that you would use this young adult group to impact Jakarta, to impact their community, to impact their families, and some here that will even go beyond the shores of Indonesia and would reach many around this world, whether it's directly or indirectly, even through their giving, through their praying, as well as through their going. Bless them now, I pray. Let them know that as they lose their lives for you and your kingdom, they will find real life. And all of their personal needs, all of their personal longings will be fully satisfied and fulfilled and met in you because they will have met their purpose on earth. And they will become all that you created them to be. Thank you, Lord, for these that are here now. Bless them, prosper them, use them, I pray, in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Brother, please come.